part two uh, of <clears throat> the 29th of October, 2020, new 302. Um, incidentally, the strange thing that Zoom did, uh, nevertheless, apparently had continuity on its side. So there may be a weird jump in that video, but it stitched those two pieces together, uh, apparently. So uh, it appears to be uploading just fine, go figure. Okay, so things that we were talking about around the hero's journey and the monomyth and some of the issues there. I mentioned that I had two concerns. Here's my second concern. And the reason that I'm bringing it up here is that it's a function of the general circularity that is part of myth and, and archetype specifically. And you'll see that this is, this is a, a broader kind of concern than just a hero's journey specifically. So whereas my first concern is that maybe, maybe it's possible that our um, peculiar modern approach to the monomyth is um, potentially draining the myth of, of, its, of its impact, of its emotional and sort of spiritual and psychological impact. Okay, so that's one concern. And as I mentioned, it's, this is not a decided thing for me but it is something that I think about. Uh, and I've mentioned in a number of places that this to me seems to be part of the kind of general issue that we have. Some of you have seen, I've talked about this. I talked about this at length in a video with John Vervecki uh, a little under a year ago where we were discussing um, a bunch of this stuff, um, which you can see on my channel under talks and interviews and it's in his channel under I think it has its own title. I don't. I think it's before we started up uh, Voices with Verveki. So anyway, um, okay. So there is this concern that I have, and it's a general concern that I have around many things in our culture, right? Uh, which is that we fast food things in our culture, right? Uh, we tend to. So the fast food industry, as some of you know, right, is. Uh, is really controlled to a great extent by food technologists and food technologists are basically chemists, experiential chemists. You know, I remember in the, the book Fast Food Nation, which uh, is a bit dated, but I do recommend. There was an experience that somebody had where the author had, where he went to a group of food chemists and they mixed together three chemicals and swished them around in a little test tube and wafted it under his nose and boom, cheeseburger, right? He had the the experience, the smell experience of cheeseburger, that that richness, which if you like it, it's a very, it's a very rich, savory kind of thing, right? Um, fast food and food technologists generally talk about the bliss point. The bliss point being this perfected combination of, of uh, fat, salt, and sugar, okay? Now, these are important factors in your general environment, fat, salt, and sugar. Fat's concentrated energy, so we like fat. We like the mouth feel. We, if we can get our hands on it, we do. Okay, well, we're not alone in this. Obviously, other organisms like fat, as I mentioned before, you know, there is some theory that saber-toothed tigers evolved their ah long saber teeth to puncture the eye sockets of early hominids so that they could get at the sweet, sweet brains inside because brains are fat, lots and lots of fat, rich fat, right? So other things like fat, we like fat too. We like the mouth feel of it. We like sugar because sugar is carbs, but particularly if things are sweet, it tends to be concentrated carbs, right? It's not like chewing a, you know, a handful of barley or something, right? We get sweet in something like fruit or even better in something like honey. And it's like, oh, right? Honey, the ambrosia, the, the drink of the gods is very sweet. And salt is important because salt is frankly hard to come by a lot of the time in a natural environment, right? That's why salt licks are big with, um, with herbivores and things, cows and deer and stuff love salt licks. Uh, we have a salt lick for the guinea pigs. I don't know how much interest they've taken in it. Some, I think. Actually, that's not true. Our, our guinea pigs, Thor and Loki, uh, Loki is sort of in some ways the more particular and cleverer of the two in keeping with their names. And we have many times observed that when they get their food, Loki will position himself in such a way as he can lick the salt and then eat some pellets and then take a drink. And he licks the salt, so he's seasoning his food, um, as Ariana, my, my partner, pointed out. Uh, he's seasoning his food. So salt is, is you know, important to us too. But in fast food, the food technologists, what do we do? We concentrate and combine those things. And we combine them in such ways to create these, these unnatural concentrations and aggregations in the environment that are immensely compelling. Hitting the bliss point for a food technologist in fast food is about creating a kind of a compulsive consumption desire, 
right? Ice cream is an excellent example of this because it triggers all these delightful mammalian responses for us, right? Because milk, milk is good, right? And if you can get access to fat and sugar and salt, it's like, right? This is why ice cream has this incredible power over people. And when I say power over people, I don't mean that sort of figuratively or even jokingly, the way that these sorts of things affect people is compulsive. People have a hard time breaking free, right? Of, of that kind of thing. It's just so, so powerful compared to natural foods. Okay, similarly, an example that I like to use sometimes is cocaine. Okay, so in its indigenous context, and even frankly, in you know most of the parts of the Andes and stuff today, coca leaves are just, they're just leaves and they're used like a mild stimulant, like tea or coffee. You know, you might make a light drink of them or you might um, chew a quid of them and they, you know, combat altitude sickness, blah, 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 right? They do all these things is mildly stimulating and humans like a mild stimulant, right? That's why caffeine is the most widely abused drug in the world, bar none, right? Um, I like it, you know, it's good. Mm. Used moderately. So used moderately, that's what coca leaves are like, but no, that's not how we use them <laughs> instead right? Our culture concentrated them into a powder and then either insufflated, railed it up their nose or added it to wine, which creates a synergistic effect or cooked it down into rocks so that they could smoke it so that they could get in it, right? There's this urge to the concentrate, to the concentrate and to the extreme. And I sometimes have the fear likewise that that is what is represented in our culture's approach to the hero journey. It's like we keep giving ourselves the hot shot over and over and over and over and over again. Right. So this concentrating effect that we have has a way of taking something that is useful and by and large harmless and often sacred and instead turns it into something that is sort of profaned through its, you know, commercial aspect and frankly used to like pull money from people instead of being sacramental stories become transactional. You pay money to get the emotional hit. Right. And often to get the by proxy feeling of transformation that comes with it, right? We all, we all get to feel good about it. Okay, so that's my first general concern and I addressed that in the last video. My second concern is broader, okay? And again, these are not necessarily issues that Jung himself was concerned with, but I think in order to ground these things out, it's important to think about them. So this, this is the concern as it sort of came to me. So I was thinking about evolution and I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about the way that life is cyclical, okay? And I was thinking about climate change and I was thinking about the way that extinction occurs. So, you know, we all know the theory of natural selection, right? Which is that evolution, you know, sort of occurs as a function of fittedness to a natural environment, right? An organism is fitted, right? And fitted doesn't mean fitness in the sense when we say survival of the fittest, we don't mean like the toughest, right? That's, that's wrong. What we mean is it finds a niche and it fits it. And that's both relative to the environment that is other organisms, right? You got to find your thing and go for it. But it's also about, <clears throat> about environmental conditions, right? That are not biological conditions, right? Climatic conditions, right? Etc. The reason that climate change, right, is, you know, aside from the fact that humans, right, have massively expanded our personal and agricultural biomass to crowd things out and we've destroyed habitats and all that junk, that's easy to figure out. Yes, obviously, right, if we burn the rainforest down, then like rainforest sloths are going to have a real problem, right? Uh, as a, an extremely striking version of this that came out in the last bunch of years, I was shocked and I think lots of people sort of laughed uh, when they found out that um, <laughs> that the crab louse is endangered, the, the the so the pubic crab louse. So what's the crab louse? It's like a form of lice, right? Which is to say, it's a small insect that you know tends to sort of commensally or parasitically occur on human beings. We think of lice as being you know scalp lice and nets, right? But the crab louse, specifically speaking, is is pubic, and the reason that it was looking uh, basically at potential endangered status uh, was habitat loss, which was to say that the massive cultural move towards hair removal at many places in the world suddenly, essentially speaking, destroyed the forest habitat that this thing lived in. Now that's vaguely funny if you think about it, but it tells you something important, right? Habitat loss can destroy things, but habitat loss isn't the only thing that 
leads to right species endangerment and species extinction. And one of the other factors is just that environmental conditions can change. So some of that can be your prey animal goes extinct, duh. And some of it can be, right, that, you know, that the, the great chain falls apart for you in some way or is polluted. But some of it can just be that the environmental conditions that you are adapted and fitted to change, right? So if we, you know, think about, um, you know, uh, an ice age, for instance, right, where there is like a sudden precipitous drop in temperature, um, you know, often largely global, but certainly regional. Why does that drive things extinct? Well, it drives things extinct because essentially speaking, they can't adapt fast enough, right? The mutation is always occurring, but like, you know, broad mutation requires time to anchor itself within an organism, um, copies and the cycle of things. If the stability of the system changes faster than, right, natural selection can catch up with, then it goes extinct. Right. Rather than the organism simply transitioning into another organism as say certain breeds of dinosaurs became what we think of as birds. Yes. And if you haven't heard birds or dinosaurs, I assume everybody's heard this at this point, but birds are dinosaurs. You can kind of tell if you look at them, they're very dinosaur-y. But anyway, birds are dinosaurs, basically, right? Some dinosaurs, other dinosaurs, they did not keep up, right? You'll notice that we don't have anything that is like a brontosaurus really. Right? There's no brontosaur bird. So if the conditions change, then the then the adaptivity of the system can't keep up. Okay. So step one. You'll see where this is going, I think. So, okay, so that's one factor. Now the thing is that that has to do with the, the cyclical nature of life, right? That life occur that there is a life cycle, right? That organisms are born. Um, they mature, they reproduce, they grow old, they die, and they are replaced by copies of themselves that are minor variations, typically, right? That's, you know, sexual reproduction is about swapping minor variations to increase the degree of adaptivity within a population, uh, or at least that's, that's the theory, right? Um, and that process is a cyclical process. So here was the thought that came to me. Archetype and myth are likewise cyclical. The reason that they're cyclical, the reason I say that, okay, is that for the most part, you can tell that they're cyclical because mm, things need to be cyclical to be predictive. And the whole point, right, of having a myth or an archetype is, maybe not the whole point, but a big part of the point is that has that predictive factor, right? When we say, like, you know, you need to know your way through the psyche or the myth of the transitions, like when we're talking about this stuff in strict psychological terms, right, around what these things mean, what's the point of any of that? Well, some of it, of course, is that you can understand what's happened to you post hoc. You can take your experiences and fit them in and suddenly make sense of them. You can gain certain kinds of insights by applying those patterns backwards into the experience of your own life or to the experience of your culture, et cetera, et cetera. But some of it is also projective right? Which is that we rely on this cyclical thing to make sense of how things are going to go for us. Now, you'll notice that I already raised an eyebrow, okay, when I use the term progress, because progress is one of the central myths of our culture, right? It's this idea that things are getting better. Now, that has taken a rude hit in the last, let's call it 30 years, it's really set in. Prior to that, it was basically a cultural given, okay, on certainly on both sides of the Cold War, which was sort of a defining ideological battle for the whole middle part of the 20th century, right? It, the defining idea was that, yeah, things are, were going to get better, that there was an, uh, an inexorable progression towards improvement, okay? And that was expressed technologically, and it was expressed in terms of cultural changes. The idea was you did better than your parents, and your children would do better than you. And of course, when you look at technology over the span that we've had it, you can see that, right? I mean, you know, look at, look at something as obvious as the progression of computers. I mean, the fact that we're even having, that you're watching me in this way, represents an astounding progression of technological power. Now, humans are good at this, right? It was only like a century and a bit ago that the first telecommunication signal got sent from one room to another by phone. And it was Alexander Graham Bell, right? Watson, come here. He said, he didn't say it like that, but that's what it sounded like, right? And in that period of time, that extremely short range communication, da da da, has been elaborated into this massive system of satellites and fiber optic cables and computer switches and interconnection and computers, which you take for granted, but like this, 
this device is not a phone. That's an incidental feature. It's a computer and you have a bunch of them. You try counting around how many computers you got. If you own a car, there's like five in there, but like how many actual functional computers you have, tablets and laptops and phones. That is an astounding rate of progression, right? Of advancement technologically. But the thing is that we as a culture have taken it as given that progress, right? This upward ascent, the things would be getting better over time. We take that as a given and that is a myth. It was central to communism, it's central to capitalism, it's central to most people's understanding of the world. That's why they're like, I want my kids to be better off than I was. That's central to, for instance, the, the whole ethos of like the immigrant work ethic when they, right? You come to a place so that your children will have a better life than you with the assumption that their children, da, 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 da. and that pattern held for quite a while. Now, ooh, the bad news, it hasn't held lately. Um, many of you will be on the front lines of this. Many of you, in fact, right, if you're of an age, will be like, what the, like, my situation is definitely not as good as my parents. For some of you, it will be. But like, as a general trend that is reliable, a predictive trend that you could just predict that your situation is going to be better. And think about the way that that myth has inflected, okay, on various other kinds of cultural patterns. University is part of that. It's part of that. That's not what university was. University has been around for a long time. The first universities are old. They're like a thousand years old, right? The Sorbonne and in France and um, Oxford and Cambridge. These are old institutions. They grew up alongside monastic institutions. And for a long time, they were sort of specialized as part of a system. But like the idea that everybody went to university, which not everybody does, but a huge number of people do, that's all post-World War II. After World War II, the GI Bill comes in. The idea is let's offer free education. Everybody gets the same idea because they're like, oh yeah, people who have a bachelor's degree get promoted into management. And so this is the way to get from, you know, like a blue collar job that potentially is going to lead to, you know, injury or whatever and is monotonous and is potentially going to lead into one of these white collar jobs, right? This is the kind of theory. That's why it's like, it's just a given. It's part of the track that you go through school, do kindergarten, you do grade school, then you do high school, right? junior high, high school, and then you go to university. And the idea is this is an inexorable progression that's going to improve your life. And that's not what the university was for, certainly. It wasn't a, it wasn't a job acquisition tool. It wasn't about that. It was a center of learning and research, right? Okay, so not that I'm ragging on the university. I, you know, obviously, I have good experiences with the university, and the university has been very kind to me. Um, somewhat to my surprise, somewhat to my, to, to my ongoing surprise, I think is what I mean. So, okay, but you can again, you can see the myth of progress in there. Okay, now, when we consider though the myth of progress, we, we also have to think about acceleration, okay? This is sort of a rambly argument right now, but I think you will see it come together. So we have to think about acceleration and Technological acceleration has been one of these things where there's been a discontinuity between the past and the future. That's sort of what's implied in progress, right? So, you know, 500 years ago, when the rate of change, cultural and technological, was relatively low, you could basically operate on the assumption that if you decided to just like do what your parents did, their knowledge would be applicable. You could learn things, you can learn a trade. You know, your father or mother were involved in carpentry, you could pick up carpentry and you could do carpentry. And the tools and the techniques were mostly stable. There would be some innovations, right? But the idea is that the basic techniques were stable. You could follow a cycle, right? But then as the rate of change goes up, that ceases to be the case, right? As the rate of change goes up, it is no longer the case that what you learn, right? That the world that your parents were in is the world that you're in, right? See how that's intrinsic to the concept of progress, although it spins it positively. With the concept of progress, we've also gradually come into the concept of future shock, which was a term that was coined by uh, um, Alvin Toffler in his 1969, 1971. It was around there. It was around 70 because he released three, one in 70, one in 80, and one in 90. Anyway, but the future, first one, future shock. And what's the premise of future shock? The premise of future shock is this. The rate of change has become such that we are disoriented by the change in our own lives. Why? Well, it's like culture shock, right? It's like culture shock. What's culture shock? Culture shock is if you move from Toronto to Italy, and you know maybe you have some cultural background there, but you're gonna you're gonna get hit, right? 
And like, you don't even really have to go that far. When I lived in England, you know, I kept getting hammered by these small differences, these culture code differences, like everything is 40% quainter, but the culture code is just that much different. I mean, there are the very obvious things. Like every time I saw a car coming towards me, I would be weirded out because either there would be nobody driving the car or there'd be like a dog driving the car until, right, my brain finally got used to, no, no, the cars are just on the other side of the road. And so are the drivers or on the other side of the car, right? But until then, your brain just reflexively is like, oh my God, there's a dog driving that car, which I did embarrassingly often, right? Or there's nobody in that car. Okay, those are small changes, but that's kind of an instance of culture shock. The patterns that I took for granted were altered by context. And England is not that different than Canada. If you moved to Italy, or I lived in India for a while, right? And there, the culture codes were quite different. And sometimes I would experience culture shock, right? I would experience this radical disembedding, this sort of alienation from the codes. And that goes across the board. It's like in terms of cultural assumptions, you know, trade. We do very little barter here. I had to learn my way through barter. Not that I had a problem with it, but I had a problem learning when it was and was not appropriate. You know, you don't go into the store, buy a pack of batteries and barter over them. I had to learn these things. It was not obvious to me that there were sticker prices, but then things that you haggled over, right? That you have to like go back and forth on pricing. And you do have to do this. It's an expectation. If you don't do it, you're basically gonna get suckered. And that goes right down the line. I mean, I used to, frankly, in India, routinely overpay for things because A, I had money and I felt like, okay, it's fair. But like, if I got a rickshaw ride, which I often did, right? Go to, instead of, calling a car, I would take a rickshaw to go someplace. And so the rickshaw drivers would congregate kind of near our, our building and whatever. And so I would go up and they would give me a price and I would offer a counter price and, you know, go back and forth. And to the extent that I didn't do that, the price would just pop up, 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 like how much can I charge you? Right. And that's just part of the culture code. It's not exploitative. That's just how it's done. Likewise, you have to learn, you know, you move to another culture, you have to learn what the expressions and tonalities are. So like this, okay, um, you know, in sort of North America, westernized Anglosphere culture, right? It's yes or no, right? Pretty simple. But then you get this thing, right? This head bubble. Those of you who know this are going to be laughing, I'm sure. But like, there are a bunch of variations of this that mean all kinds of different things. And nobody ever is like, well, what I'm saying is you just have to figure it out that's culture shock. Your predictive patterns don't apply. And all of a sudden you're like, I don't know what things mean anymore. Okay. Future shock is to culture shock. Okay. Uh, as space is to, or future shock is to culture shock as time is to space. So what I mean is this, yeah, you can go and go to India and experience culture shock, but then you come home and as long as you haven't been there too long, you return to your own culture, right? Your own baseline culture. If you go someplace long enough, you will find in the right space that you don't quite fit in there, but then you come back and you don't fit in here either, which is a, a weird, jarring experience to people that travel sometimes express, right? Um, uh, incidentally, culture shock, I think, is also behind the funny phenomenon that I've noticed, which is if you travel internationally, um, uh, the degree of closeness that you experience to somebody who you know uh, narrows the further away from home you are. So if you run into a fellow Canadian in a place where you haven't seen any, the likelihood that you're going to like, ah, and go for like a drink and hang out when normally you would just walk past each other. The point is that you're like, you're like, oh, common culture code, let's touch base. And part of that is because often you're looking to give yourself a bit of a break from the culture shock, right? To some extent, even if you're really in to traveling. Okay. So the point is you can go home, you can come home. With future shock, not so. With future shock, the past is not coming back. It isn't coming back. The world that your grandparents were born into isn't the world that they're in now. The world your parents were born into isn't the world you're in now. And where progress, the myth of progress seeks to spin that to the positive. It's like, yes, and it's better. The point is that it's not just better. People know that it's different. In some ways it's improved, Lord knows, right? On the human rights front, things are not perfect, far from it, but vastly better in lots of ways, right? There are improvements, there are technological improvements. Yes, that's true, but it's not all improvement. It's not all improvement. And people, again, often with a certain amount of nostalgia and frankly, more often with rancid nostalgia, look to the past. Future shock is that sense that the homeland is slipping away from you 
and there's no way to get it back. And if you want to look at people's response to that, look no further than the kinds of fundamentalist movements that often occur in religion, which is like, things are changing too quickly. We have to retreat to an older and more fundamental interpretation of things to guide our lives. That's fundamentalism. It's also fundamentalism when it occurs, if, if anybody here follows um, sort of the Supreme Court, and there's been a lot of stuff in the, around the American Supreme Court um, lately because, you know, appointees just got through and there's this really interesting uh, sort of um, asymmetry going on in terms of the politics of the court, and that's going to have long-term effects. But like, there is a big movement in the Supreme Court right, towards a, a sort of fundamentalism towards the Constitution. Now, never mind that I think that if you look at that closely, it's extremely unevenly applied. Um, people are highly selective in how originalist they decide to be about a document. But you can kind of see the same thing. That fundamentalist na nature is like, oh, we need to hearken back to this document. It's just that in that case, the document is the Constitution, which despite the fact that it has amendments and was created by human beings in a historical context is treated as a kind of sacred document, right? Like it fell out of the sky, um, right? And so it's like, we have to go back, we have to go back. Okay, you can see the same thing in broader political movements. Make America great again. That's a golden age argument. It's the same golden age argument that you see turn up all over the place. And look, I'm hesitant here to invoke Godwin's law, which is like, if any conversation, originally any internet conversation, but any conversation proceeds long enough, right? Uh, it trends towards Nazis. Oh, damn it. I never hit the clock. Okay, I'm gonna dial it down. I think it's been like half an hour. Burp, burp, burp. Sorry, my bad. I forget about this thing. Okay, so, I'm, I'm wary here in mentioning the Nazis. So just take this with a grain of salt. I'm not necessarily saying, but the Nazis basically were interested in the same thing. It was kind of golden age argument. Fascism, generally speaking, is a kind of golden age argument, right? Mussolini in Italy was like, we have to return to the glory, a second Roman empire, basically, right? And notably, this is the same kind of appeal that Nazi Germany made. Hitler was like, we used to be great, now, also, there was a significant amount of scapegoating, some paranoid stuff, a lot of occult theory. But the point was, the basics of it are like, we have to return to this fundamental greatness, fundamental, foundational greatness, right? And that is where, you know, the our future is the past, basically. Make America great again is the same kind of argument. It's the same kind of argument. It is also the same kind of argument, I add, that you see with... Um, with uh, ISIS, okay? So ISIS, the Islamic, um, you know, uh, depending on how you look at it, sort of terrorist group, at the very least political movement, right? People are gonna differ about this. But the point is, it's like, what was it? It was essentially this kind of return to a, a, an earlier golden age notion of the caliphate and certain kinds of interpretations of, of Islam, right? Now, if you wanna be uncharitable, you can look at that stuff and be like, you know what this is basically? Highly aggressive cosplay, you know? It's LARPing, it's, it's, um, it's uh, <laughs> cosplay at Comic-Con, except it's cosplay at Comic-Con of a certain kind of golden age when men were men and women were nothing or God was great. And, you know, like that's essentially what it's getting at, okay? Is this return to the golden era. Now, I'm not impugning that desire to pull from the past. In a sense, that's kind of the essence of the golden shadow. It's like, are there things that we left behind that are worth talking about? But obviously it can become quite malicious. So if we're talking about MAGA or if we're talking about, right, which by times can be quite malicious, right? Um, it ha does so in an ends justify the means sort of way. But the point is that the golden era that it points back to, right, is, is a kind of mythic, sepia hued, you know, 1950s TV tint kind of vision of things, um, which is not very in keeping with where the trends are going. And that is why it gets so agitated. It gets agitated because that's not the direction things seem to be pointing. And people are like, ah, ah, where's the homeland? Which is to say future shock. Where is, where's the country I grew up in? People say, and they freak out, okay? And it's, you know, when you think about it in those terms, Right? It's the same thing that you see in so many of these movements that fundamentally are like, we've lost something, we've lost something. It is the panic around modernity. It's the dark side of progress. 
right? Progress is like, everything's getting better, right? Better living through chemistry and, and right? I was like, um, the vision of NASA, right? The American space program allegedly was strongly, strongly influenced by Star Trek. Um, I'm a Star Trek guy, so that appeals to me, but like their vision was like, we move, we're moving towards Star Trek, okay? The vision on the Soviet side, Soviet cosmonauts, the Soviet space program was, uh, let me think, uh, something like by, by the year 2000, we'll be eating pineapples on the moon. It's an interesting idea, right? But it's like a forward facing vision, pineapples on the moon. It's nice, right? You'll note there are no pineapples on the moon so far as we've detected, although apparently there's water. We'll see if that's overblown. Last week there were last week there were significant organic chemicals uh, on Venus or, or were there? If you follow science, you're used to these flips, right? It's the nature of the beast. So, okay. So all of that, future shock, right? And progress. Why am I talking about any of this in an archetypal sense? Well, the reason that I'm talking about it in this particular archetypal sense is this. I got thinking about climate change and I got thinking about the way that climate change changes the ground underneath cyclical organisms faster than they can adapt. And so they get wiped out. I mean, that's the deal. And then I thought we are moving into a period of change on the earth where things are changing incredibly rapidly. We've been in a mostly climate stable period and notice how that's enabled certain things. It's enabled us to do things like basically predict the seasons, which allows for agriculture. If you can't predict the seasons and the floods, you think about the ancient Egyptians, right? They're, waiting on the flood of the Nile. And that is what they do. And they can shape it, they can control it, but it's basic predictability. If you know when the monsoon is coming, you plan around it. If you know what time of year it's gonna be warm or what time of year it's gonna be cold, you know the frequency of things, that predictive stuff is what effectively enables you to get civilization together. And that same cyclical predictive factor also underlies the sorts of loops that we see in myth. So here is the fear that I have. The fear that I have is I wonder <clears throat> to what extent the current cycles of archetypal myth are going to apply as things change. Now, I think about this because, I mean, it's my business, I guess, to think about it. It's kind of my job. Um, I think about it in part because it's like, when we look at something like the hero's journey, we're drawing on a, on a kind of myth that, as I mentioned, at a very high level of abstraction is sort of universal. Like you can apply it to anything. It sort of doesn't matter at some level what comes your way. If you hit it at that high level, it's like, oh yeah, right. I have a problem. I need to overcome my resistance and the various problems and I have to descend and then I've got to transform and get the insight. And then as a new person return and the solution, right? Yeah, that's a very abstracted level. And you kind of, in a way, I think maybe you can't, like that would apply anywhere, but there are other kinds of mythologies that, that in a sense, right, our, our predictive mythologies may or may not, you know, apply. Uh, so, so where am I going with this? I guess my secondary concern here that I'm, I'm getting at, and I'm just sort of trying to provoke some thinking here about this stuff, because as we get into it, as we get into the idea that cultures are moving in cyclical ways, right, according to these kinds of mythic patterns to a great extent, and that our own lives are structured by them, and that we're sort of surrounded and swimming in them, you know, there's also the question about to what extent those things are adaptive. Are they strictly eternal, or are they more like, you know, the circular patternings that we see in nature otherwise? It's a good question. And when we consider this stuff, right, you can look at it. I mean, my stance obviously is to try to integrate it together with cognitive science and thus with sort of, you know, naturalism, with sort of the existing body of scientific knowledge. Now, I try to remain radically open minded about the unknown, what we haven't discovered, but in terms of like patterns that we've seen that seem to work out pretty well, you want to square off with those things. And so one of the things that, you know, is sort of one of the cutting edges in the theory around this stuff is how it interfaces with evolution. So if these patterns are evolved and they've evolved within a certain stable period of time, you know, the certain stable period of time in which humans are evolved, then as the conditions change, does that mean that myths can no longer, myths are no longer predictive in some way? It's a good question. Now, there are myths about this. So, so that's the interesting thing. Myths have things to say about this, which is where you get myths of the apocalypse. And there are lots of myths of the apocalypse. The world ends in flood. 
The world ends in fire, the world ends in winter, right? Sometimes some combination of those things, right? And what do those myths say, typically? Well, they say something like this. Mm, the situation changed, and then it got catastrophically bad, and almost everybody died. And then at the very end, there was like a remainder that formed a kind of a new covenant. And that new covenant, right? Okay. So in a way, sure. You can look at you can look at the cycle of change at that level and be like, okay, like <clears throat> dinosaurs ruled the earth for hundreds of millions of years. And then by our best guess, a, a comet came at tremendous speed and mass and smashed into the Yucatan and formed an enormous uh, fireball and shrouded the earth in darkness. And these creatures that had been doing their circular thing in a very predictable way for a long time suddenly couldn't keep up and they went out. But what happened? All these wee little, you know, scurrying shrew-like, I have several scurrying creatures, although they're bigger than a shrew, these scurrying shrew-like, mouse-like little mammals that couldn't really find a place anywhere else, suddenly there was an opening, right? There was a new dispensation, a new covenant in a way. There were new conditions. And under those new conditions, there was suddenly an opening for these things. If you go and read the sort of apocalypse myths, right? The um, apocalypse myths of say North, Norse mythology, which is pretty distant from most of our lived experience. You can look at the God of Damarung, right? The twilight of the gods, which is like when all the old gods, you know, Thor and Zeus, or <laughs> Zeus, Thor and Odin, <laughs> Zeus, Zeus didn't, he did, never did a cameo even. When you look at Thor, Thor and Odin and Baldur and Freya and right, most of those gods, they die out. There's a huge, you know, end of the universe battle, which interestingly for their myth, they know they're coming. That's one of the things that makes them gods, right? They, they know it's just a question of when but they know exactly how it's gonna unfold. It unfolds anyway. Um, yeah, but then at the end, what do you get? You get kind of a second Adam and a second Eve. Same thing, right? The end of sort of the, the Judeo-Christian cycle of the Christian Bible is very much in that mold. Like the world is racked with plagues and destruction and a thousand years of darkness and the antichrist and right. The old Jerusalem gets crushed underneath this uh, giant golden jeweled Jerusalem that flies down. But then there is the new era, the second Eden, right? The new coming. There is a, a second dispensation. Very similar, I add, to what happens after the first flood myth. Okay. So there's a kind of answer here, right? The answer of death and, and rebirth. Now, note that that death and rebirth doesn't guarantee that things just go back to the way that they were. Uh, and I'm invoking the sort of the dinosaur mammal comparison here because yeah, you know, at the end of that destruction, there was a new Adam and Eve, but it wasn't the dinosaurs except birds. It wasn't the dinosaurs. It was shrew-like mammals that then formed their own regime. And ah, here we are. So if our situation changes, the question of death and rebirth, like myths have things to say, but the question becomes like, is it the old myths that take the stage in that new regime? It's a good question. And frankly, you know, apocalyptic thinking is on a lot of people's minds. Um, you know, for obvious reasons, it has been a hell of a year. It's been a hell of a bunch of years, more or less since David Bowie died. Uh, no, that's glib. Uh, I do feel that way actually, but uh, it goes back further than that, obviously. Um, you know, it's been on people's minds and you know, the, the creaky system in which we find ourselves is pretty front and center. One of the things people will talk about pretty baldly now is the way that, you know, COVID has exposed a lot of flaws in frankly, what was, I think if you were paying attention pretty obviously an imperfect system, but it's really exposed that. Likewise for, uh, you know, on the demographic assumption that most of the people who are currently watching me are below a certain age, right? Certainly younger than I am for the most part. Um, you know, the, the old covenant, the old agreement doesn't seem to be holding up, you know, and that's a myth, the myth of progress. So I wonder about how our other myths fit in. And sometimes, sometimes if I'm like in a really speculative frame of mind, I find myself wondering about the hero's journey too. And I find myself wondering about it in this sense. At the highest level up here, that abstract level, like I said, I think it's eternal. I think it's eternal. I think it expresses an eternal structure. And, and it's an eternal structure because it's abstract, because it's broad. But down at this lower level, this myth of conquest at some level, and right? 
I sometimes wonder, sometimes, whether or not that is necessarily going to have a place in the future. I mean, one of the things that, of course, gets to me about it is, is, the, is the, the conflictual war aspect to it. And of course, you can interpret that metaphorically. Of course you can, right? You can interpret it as inner struggle and you can. But for a lot of people, the warrior ethos is a warrior ethos. Now, I don't think there's something intrinsically wrong with that. But consider, you know, that in the last hundred years, less, the warrior ethos has brought us into a very dangerous position, right? It's brought us into a very dangerous position. Uh, we've had atomic weapons since 1945 and the nuke, <laughs> uh, you know, not to give you extra things to worry about, but like the nuke hasn't gone away. Those things are around. I'm a child of the Cold War. You know, I was born in 78. So I grew up in the 80s when the nuke was still a going concern as i've mentioned it i had nightmares about nukes for years the you know the the kind of ethos around that and like consider for a second how that works it's like that's the way your ethos carried to uh, to an apocalyptic extreme you know richard nixon famously apparently once said to a, a dinner full of senators i could walk out of this room and 20 minutes later 70 million people would be dead now that hasn't happened. Good. That's good. Right. But the point is, it's like that represents a profound elevation of power that is right. The functional power grasp of the warrior ethos. So as a child of the cold war, I sometimes wonder like maybe, maybe it's the case that we can't do this anymore. That at some level, right. That grasping this sort of warrior ethos version of the myth is, is going to lead us into a, into a place that sort of inevitably cascades towards destruction. Now, what would it mean to overcome that? Well, presumably it would mean to sublimate it to some extent. And that's one of the reasons why, in fact, I'm very concerned with trying to explore the more psychological dimension of this, right? Because a lot of the time, you know, yes, it's not that there are never problems in the world. Of course, there are problems in the world. Of course, there are things that need to be overcome in the world. But, you know, what would happen if as a culture, we decided to turn our efforts to resolving the wars within us, right? What if we focused on, on that to the extent of having external domination, you know, was like secondary? I don't think you, you're not easily going to remove that from human nature, <laughs> such as it is. And who knows, genetic engineering and cybernetics and who the hell knows what's coming down the pipe. Right, uh, it could be that a great big rude cultural shock, if right, but you know the question of whether or not we can remove that, or whether or not we can sublimate it, whether or not we can use culture to turn it in in some way, right? Okay, so the hero's journey. Um, okay, I want to round things out, um, and I want to round things out with an interesting instance of the hero's journey and. I think it's interesting. I mean, for one thing, I just think it's fundamentally interesting. But I also think it's interesting because of the subtlety that it brings at some level to the hero's journey. Um, and it's it's fascinating. So the story that I want to talk about is the Epic of Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh. So you don't know the Epic of Gilgamesh is, is old. It's like very nearly, if not in fact, the oldest story that we have on record. These tablets are like thousands of years uh, BCE. Okay. It's Babylonian Sumerian in its origin. So it comes out of um, sort of the Fertile Crescent, the area, right area of what is currently Iraq that used to be fertile. Now it's largely desertous, um, but at the time it was fertile. And, you know, it's the cradle of civilization, which as it turns out, if you actually follow archaeology, turns out to not quite be accurate. But the point is the story is old. And we found that on in, in like cuneiform on clay tablets. Okay, we've found a few instances scattered here and there of this story. And the Epic of Gilgamesh, you know, bearing in mind, this is like a story that we have that's one of the oldest stories that we have recorded is very much a hero's journey story. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you and fairly off the cuff, I won't read it to you, I'll just tell you this story of the Epic of Gilgamesh because I think it's really interesting. Okay, so Gilgamesh was a king of the city of Ur, U-R, Ur, the, you know, the greatest city in the world. Okay, and he was a mighty king. And when I say he was a mighty king, they describe him as being uh, 
uh, one third man and two thirds God, I think is how they put it. Uh, might be the reverse, might be two thirds man and one third God. Anyway, he had a healthy portion of God in him. He's an extremely powerful person, um, right? A powerful personality and personally like mighty. Okay, and he was a mighty king of Ur, but he was a jerk. The people like found him really intolerable. He was a tyrant. And when I say he was a tyrant, I don't mean that so much he was like engaged in intentional cruelty, but he was profoundly selfish. So like one of the things that he used to do is um, when young couples, right, would, would be married, right, on their betrothal, he would insist on sleeping with the bride before the groom. You can imagine how that went over. So like, you know, he, he wanted to get into every marriage before the actual couple, okay? Now, on this account, also he picked fights and because he was extremely powerful, that was a problem. But the people of Ur basically have had enough of this with this bride stuff. And so they, they pray to the gods, right? They pray to the gods to, to sort of deliver them from Gilgamesh and sort of this thing out because he's great, but like, God damn it, right? Like, too much. So the gods try to come up with a solution. And what they come up with is they create this being called uh, Enkidu, right? Enkidu. And Enkidu is a, is a wild man. He's, uh, he's sort of like half beast, half man. So he partakes from the natural power. And he is sort of as powerful as Gilgamesh. And they sort of set him in the wilderness. And so he's running around and the locals cite him. Like he drinks, he drinks at the water hole. Um, with the other animals and stuff. And when men see him, he's spooked and right, but he's also extremely powerful. And so finally, in order to sort of bring him into the civilized fold, um, a courtesan is dispatched, which essentially speaking is like a, um, a relatively classy kind of professional sex worker, a, a prostitute, but that doesn't quite convey it. Anyway, this courtesan is dispatched and she does her courtesan seduction thing, right? And he is entranced by her and then they lay together right, by the water hole. And when he wakes up, all the other animals are terrified of Enkidu and they flee from him and he weeps because he's been severed from that connection with the natural world, right? But he's been in some sense humanized, right? And he goes back with her. So he goes back to kind of the villages around the great walled city of Ur. And he hears this story about the mighty Gilgamesh who's like, you know, basically mightily insisting on coming into people's homes and sleeping with their brides, right? And he's like, no, not going to happen. Not on my watch. So the next time Gilgamesh shows up at one of these houses, Enkidu bars his way. And Gilgamesh, of course, you know, is like, who the f are you? Get out of my way. And Enkidu is like, not going to happen, right? So they, they tussle, right? They, they get into it. And he tries to like push Enkidu aside. And Enkidu is also mighty. And so they tussle. And they tussle for three days and three nights, right? It's like they're, you know, knocking over, you know, mountains and trees and stuff. They're very powerful. And so they fight and they fight and they fight and they fight and they fight to a standstill. And in classic buddy uh, cop, buddy movie fashion, they then become fast friends. They basically, they like move to exhaustion and all of a sudden Gilgamesh is like, ah, you're great. Uh, you're great. Finally, I have met an equal. Finally, I have a partner, right? And he's like, come on, we're gonna, you know, go on a, on a, about a buddy quest. And then Enkidu's like, uh, okay, you know, that's how I always picture him. Anyway, okay, so the very first thing that they decide on, and, and the people get recourse, and Gilgamesh stops doing this dumb shit where he's like invading other people's houses because he's got a buddy and everybody's like, ah, right? So Gilgamesh and Enkidu, right, together. Um, great. So Gilgamesh says, I know what we can do. I know what we can do. We're going to go to uh, da, 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 Lebanon. We're going to go to the great cedars of Lebanon. Lebanon, Syria. I think it's Lebanon. Anyway, we're going to go to the great... You can read this in multiple translations, I had. You don't have to just take my word for it. Um, okay, you can go to the... We're going to go to the cedars. And in the, the forest of the cedars, there is a giant called Humbaba. And Humbaba is, we picture a giant, it's like we picture a big guy, but Humbaba is like a spirit, like a demon. He's like a, you know, very large and powerful, but also like a massively terrifying spiritual force. And he's like, what we're going to do is we're going to go, we're going to kill Humbaba, the giant of the cedar forest, and then we're going to cut cedars down and steal them. And, and he's like, that's what we're going to do, buddy, buddy comedy. So they start heading that way. 
Then they get into the, the forest and there are sounds in the forest and Enkidu begins to grow afraid. And he's like, I think this is like a bad idea, right? They can hear stuff out there. I think it's a bad idea. And Gilgamesh is like, bear up, bear up, my friend, you know, uh, we've got this. Sadly, at this point, we lose some tablets. <laughs> this is the way with very old stories. It's like somebody ripped the pages out of the metal. So we've lost some tablets. We don't know exactly what happened. There are some fragments that we have. We have the end of the story just to hold it. We, we have some fragments that indicate that maybe um, Humbaba had a series of sort of seven appearances, masks or veils that he removed or that they had to fight. It's not totally clear. But the point is they kill Humbaba, okay? They're terrified, but they bear up and together they kill Humbaba. They kill him, they cut his head off, and then they cut down the cedars of Humbaba's forest and they float them down river back to Ur and they begin to build a mighty palace temple, okay, with these enormous um, cedars. So like, wow, this is like a big deal. These two guys together, you know, are um, getting sort of tremendous accomplishments, right? And this gets the gods' attention a little bit because Humbaba, as much as he is a monster and a demon and a giant, nevertheless, is sort of a being of the spiritual world. And it's like, uh, you know, um, mortals are off slaying things, but okay, he's a giant, he's a demon. Uh, okay, right? So with his mighty deeds, Gilgamesh, the great king, is then approached, okay, by, um, by Ishtar, the love goddess. And when I say the love goddess, what I really properly mean is the sex goddess, okay? It's not romantic love in the context, but it is erotic love. It's sex goddess, right? So she is voluptuous and she is desire, and right? She's like Aphrodite or Venus. So, so she approaches Gilgamesh and she says, Gilgamesh, you're quite a man. Um, and Gilgamesh is like, oh, thanks, right? In his chambers. And she's like, I want you to lay with me. Oh, Gilgamesh um, has heard stories. Okay, uh, literacy is not invented yet, I add, we'll get to that. But Gilgamesh has heard lots of stories and the stories it has heard are probably of the kind that you've heard, if you've read, you know, lots of Greco-Roman myths or whatever, about, you know, how mortals get tangled together with gods and often this does not go well for the mortals, right? And so she's like, oh, you know, you should lie with me, Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh says, and this is such an interesting response to me, okay? And it's an interesting response because in a way it's a very modern response considering that it's such an old story so bear that in mind right and what he says is he says this he says i've read the stories about you and it sort of seems like things don't go super well for your lovers so i'm gonna take a hard pass on that one right i'm gonna take a hard pass on that one and what he says is let the gods remain in heaven and men will remain on earth you know okay now and, and that's sort of his, that's his position. It's like, mm, no, thanks. No, thanks though. Thanks. Okay. This is not done. She, Ishtar, like, I mean, it is not a thing that mortals do. So Ishtar goes back up to heaven and she appeals to Enlil, who is the sky god, the father god, her father, and but also the, the father of the gods, the ruler of the gods. And basically she's like, daddy, you know, Gilgamesh rejected me and you need to smite him basically. And Enlil is kind of like, honey, like, just let this go. Can you just let this go? And she's like, daddy, you had better do something about this. Nobody rejects the love goddess, sex goddess. Nobody rejects me. I am desire. Nobody rejects me. And certainly not Gilgamesh. Do something about it. And Enlil is like, can't you just like calm down? Like, just take it easy, sweetheart. Okay, whatever, which is pretty patronizing. And then she says, daddy, do something about this or I'm going to tear the gates off of hell and the dead will rise and the dead will outnumber the living and the dead will devour the living. So she threatens a generalized zombie apocalypse. Yeah, and this can't happen. So Enlil is like, okay, fine. We're going to dispatch a punishment. And he dispatches a punishment in the form of the bull of heaven, which is another kind of divine monster, right? This enormously powerful thing, which goes to Ur and it means business. Gilgamesh and Enkidu see the bull of heaven coming right basically and they're like tag team and they they get in there and they wrestle and they succeed because together they are powerful right individually they are mighty but together so they overcome the bull of heaven and they overcome the bull of heaven and they they kill it they kill this thing right and that's like a big deal right this is like the divine instrument of vengeance 
furthermore, after this happens, okay, Enkidu looks up and he sees Ishtar, the, the goddess of desire, on the walls of the city of Ur. And, and knowing what's happened, presumably because he's talked to his friend, guinea pigs are just going bonkers. Okay, I don't know if they like Gilgamesh. Anyway, uh, right, he sees Ishtar, the love goddess, up on the walls of Ur. And, and in uh, like scorn, he tears the, the wet haunch, right? Tears the leg basically of raw meat from the bull of heaven and hurls it at her, okay? And she's got it, so she vanishes, presumably. Okay, now here's the thing. You can't do this. You can't. You can't just go around killing the bull of heaven, okay? You have to kind of take your lumps, you're mortal. And you definitely can't hurl raw meat at the love goddess. Like the insult is too much. And so the gods kind of agree uh, that this is like too much. And so they strike Enkidu with a plague to make him sick. So he gets sick and he gets sick and Gilgamesh calls as he gets sicker and sicker. Gilgamesh calls all these healers. Like this is his best friend. He calls all these healers from everywhere, everywhere he can. Nobody knows what to do. It's like, it's a divine illness. There's nothing to do about it. And Enkidu is getting sicker and sicker and Gilgamesh is intensely distraught. And he wants to solve the problem and he can't solve the problem. And then at last, at last, uh, Enkidu was dying and Gilgamesh uh, is sort of by his bedside and Enkidu is dying. And Enkidu's basic last words are, I wish I had never met you. I wish I had stayed with the animals, I, but I wish I had never met you. And then he dies. Gilgamesh is devastated, devastated. He's devastated to have lost his friend, right? His best friend and his adventuring companion. But he's also devastated because he suddenly realizes death, right? If death can come for Enkidu, death can come for Gilgamesh. He has the moment of mortality, right? It's like, oh my God. And he knows that he has to do something about it. So he starts trying to solve the problem. He leaves the city of Ur. Oh, there's only one minute left on the clock, but I'm finishing this story. Okay, I'll go quick though. So he leaves the city of Ur and he starts to investigate various means by which he can achieve immortality. And it turns out like lots of these things just aren't gonna work, but he hears about an immortal man, not a, not a God, right? There are things that are open to the gods, but that aren't, aren't open to mortals. But he hears about this, this, um, uh, this immortal man and the immortal man is named Utnapishtim. Utnapishtim. So, so he goes and he seeks out Utnapishtim. And to seek out Utnapishtim, he has to like travel really far. He has to go through like the mountains of the moon and he has to get past some like scorpion men. And it's, you know, it's like cool quest stuff. And finally he finds Utnapishtim and his wife. And when he gets there, Utnapishtim, he's like, tell me Utnapishtim, like how did you achieve immortality? And Utnapishtim says, oh, you know, that's an interesting story. And they recognize the story. He says, well, you know, I actually come from sort of the first world. And what happened was that we were too noisy. And the gods decided we were too noisy. So they, they decided they were going to flood the world and kill everybody because we, humans were making too much noise. He said, but before that happened, because I was pious with the gods, they told me it was going to happen. And they gave me instructions of a boat that I ought to build. And I should collect animals for the new world. And if you don't recognize this story. This is extremely similar in the first historical instance we have of the story of Noah's Ark, okay? So, you know, this is the thing. And then when it was all said and done and the world had flooded and been destroyed and then it had receded, the gods as, you know, a sort of penance to me for having destroyed the world in a way granted me immortality. So that's why I'm immortal. And Gilgamesh says, crap, like that's not, <laughs> that's not gonna work. And the Pishtim was like, no. He said, however, however, I happen to know, he said, because the floodwaters have not fully receded. They are still the ocean and so on and so forth, right? Those waters are still left from the flood. And he said, I happen to know that there exists a plant now at the bottom of the ocean, which is capable, if consumed, of granting immortality. And Gilgamesh says, hot damn, where is it? And he's like, well, it's at the bottom of the ocean. So Gilgamesh goes and he goes to the shore and he is mighty. And so he's like, okay, here we go. Splish, right? And he swims down, right? Swims down, down, down. He's mighty. He swims to the bottom of the ocean. And when he gets down there, darkness, cold, crushing pressure, he, he finds the plant. There it is. The magical plant waving at the bottom, right? Um, 
I add, this is a bit like the Garden of Eden story with the Tree of Life and so on and so forth. But in this case, there is like a combo. Myth. So it's interesting to see these various crossovers in Semitic myth. But anyway, so there's the plant at the bottom of the ocean and he snatches it up. And then uh, the tremendous labor of trying to swim back to the surface. And he's mighty, but he is at the end of the day mortal. And this takes a lot out of him. And so he gets to the surface and he breaks through the surface and he, and he stumbles onto the beach and, and he collapses with exhaustion. Right, this tremendous labor he's gone through, the mountains of the moon, scorpion men swimming to the bottom of the ocean and what. He's exhausted, so he collapses on the beach, plant in hand. And a rogue snake comes up and it sees that he's got something in his hand that is edible and eats it. And the snake achieves immortality, <laughs> which is why the snake sheds its own skin. This is another thing myths love to do, right? Explain features of the natural world, but it is not their only function. Although that is the function people most frequently discount and say, no, we have science. Okay, so there, there's more to learn there than just like that's why sna snakes shed their skin, but let's not linger here. I assume if you've come this far in the course, you're more or less on board with this. So the snake eats it and it sheds its skin, achieves immortality. And Gilgamesh wakes up and the plant is gone. And that's it. No immortality for Gilgamesh. And he weeps. This is the first time he weeps. He didn't weep when Enkidu died, but he weeps. He just breaks down. He doesn't have the strength to go back. That was it. That was his big pitch. And he's just struck and crushed with sadness. And he returns to the city of Ur. And when he returns to the city of Ur, he invents a bunch of things. You know, he invents metallurgy. I don't, I'm not sure why. But one of the things that he invents, most notably, is he invents literacy. He invents writing in this myth, right? He invents the cuneiform that is, in fact, the very writing that is on the tablets the story is on. He is, right, supposed to have invented this as the greatest king. Why does he invent it? He invents it so that he can take down this story, the story of, of him and Enkidu and their battles and Humbaba and Ishtar and the Bull of Heaven and the immortality plant, but he is crushed by sadness. He invents all these things, but he becomes a wise and chastened king, becomes a great king, right? But he's sad. Um, and then he dies, right? Lives out his days, he's a great king and dies. The end, epic of Gilgamesh. Now it is epic, but I want you to think about this and I don't wanna explicate it partly because I'm over time. <laughs> I don't wanna explicate it too much, but think about that in terms of the hero's journey. What did he go looking for? What did he find? So think about that and think a little bit about the hero's journey and the general concept of the monomyth and mythology and what it means, what, what are we looking for? What do we need? Uh, you know, we go looking for one thing, we find something else. Uh, and, you know, to some extent, is that something that is itself eternal and thus will survive any transition and any apocalypse? Is there some eternal shape that things take uh, no matter what changes. Okay, um, we're out of time, which is too bad because we didn't get to, it's Halloween in like two days. I, I brought all this stuff out. I brought out, the, I brought out the steampunk monocle and I brought out the World War II era helmet and I brought out the, the Spock ears. Anyway, okay. Well, nevertheless, uh, no time for costume changes today. No time for costume changes. So uh, I hope you enjoy this. And I hope that you do take the opportunity on Halloween. I know nobody can go out. And we can't have parties, obviously. But nevertheless, take some time, maybe watch some horror movies, but also think about the interesting interface between the shadow and the persona and what it means to put your shadow on, because that's what Halloween is about. Okay, so uh, hopefully you enjoyed that and I will see you guys both tonight. Uh, yeah, tonight, but also next week.